Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's focus on education movers, shakers, and reformers. Special guests that have insights into all matters of education from preschool to K through 12 to higher education. We're live streaming at noon every Wednesday. I'm Jim Sean. I'm your host. And today's special guest is Dr. Carl Ackerman, who has been involved with what I would call our theme of the day, student-centered partnerships. From teaching history for 30 years, uh, starting a nonprofit uh, focus on service learning, and now director of a very special program, Pueo, and we'll define that in a minute, uh, at Punahou School during the summer for um, uh, low-income uh, students from the public schools. Welcome, Carl. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. It's you, a pleasure to be here. You have spent an entire lifetime in education. I have. Tell, tell us a little bit about that, that journey as a background. Well, you know, uh, being a public school kid myself, you know, I grew up in Santa Monica and uh, went to Santa Monica High School, then went to a, a wonderful example like the University of Hawaii. It was the University of California as a student, and I began my educational career by pursuing a very esoteric subject, Russian history. Um, and this led to education, and <clears throat> the, um, the real issue was that uh, Iolani School came through Berkeley, believe it or not, and said, uh, I was a sort of a starving graduate student, and said, would you like to come to Hawaii and teach history? And I said, is that a real offer? And it was made by a wonderful head of school at Iolani named David Kuhn. And I got on the next plane, and here I was in Hawaii. And so for most of my career here, I've been teaching history, either at Iolani School or Punahou School, uh -huh. and getting involved with a lot of students. The, the irony is that when I, I went back after teaching at Iolani for nine years, and got a PhD in Russian history. And uh, the, the reason I was able to do that is because I sat in a, the wonderful Russian classes at Iolani School um, for five years and sat with the kids and learned with the kids and uh, was able to pursue a, a PhD because I learned not only from the instructor, a, a wonderful guy who's uh, moved on and, and passed on, um, Walter Holden, uh, but also I learned from uh, many of the students, uh, one of whom um, is the older brother of our current senator, Brian Schatz. His ah. name is Edward Schatz and he's gainfully employed at the University of Toronto as a Russianist and I think one of the few people in the world that speaks fluent Kazaki. So there you go. Oh, so and you learned Russian when you were sitting in at Iolani? Yes. After, you know, I sat in with the kids. I was like, I, <laughs> I was much bigger. I didn't have as much gray hair then, so my their hair color was similar, but uh, that's how I learned my Russian. So that's amazing that they were actually offering Russian mm -hmm. and presumably other languages as well. German, French, Japanese, Chinese. And, you know, one of the mm -hmm. Chinese teachers, for example, was a a real scholar, and uh, not that the other teachers weren't, but he was someone who was, you know, well-trained and uh, knew all the classics in Chinese, so uh -huh. it was great. Well, I wanted to ask you a little bit about this notion of teaching history. You know, with the Internet, people say, well, you can just go look it up, right? Uh, are students still interested in history? You know, I, I just finished a, because they took their test, an advanced placement European history test, and I think it's the role of the, of the teacher to work with the students and make it, as you say, very student-centered. And, um, you know, it's, uh, the kids always say to me, sometimes they say, well, is it important to, to know dates? And I say, well, is your birthday important? You know, <laughs> you know your parents, you know, wedding anniversary important? So, you know, it's, it's, and if you could teach history from sort of a cultural viewpoint, and also if you could teach history that, you know, these were people who lived um, in a different period with a different sort of zeitgeist, I think kids get fascinated. And, you know, sometimes I think there's a tendency now in education to make everything somehow connected to the present. And, and I look at it sort of in an opposite way. I think that the kids, in order, in order to really understand history, have to use their imagination and think about what it was like in a different period of time. And I think by so doing, it makes kids other than myself. You know, they, they begin to think about things that are not necessarily just concerning themselves. And to answer your question, you know, I've never had a, a lack of students in, the, in any of my classes, and it's just, it's not me, it's other teachers at, you know, in the DOE and in Iolani and at Punahou, so. Uh -huh. 
Well, that's good to hear that it's still <laughs> a relevant subject. Uh, one does hear a lot of educational talk about don't do rote memorization, which means learn and remember, uh, and just do critical thinking. And that, that shift uh, to we don't need to remember anything, we can look it up, is, is wheedling its way into education. Do you find that? Um, I, I do, and I think I'm sort of a good blend between um, process and content. But um, for example, my students in my class often are asked to write what they are called salient points. And what they have to do is they have to read uh, our textbook, um, come up with points that they think are significant, write a paragraph um, uh, behind each point, mm -hmm. and then um, come in and discuss the points in class. And my job, of course, is to see what they're doing and to put it within sort of some sort of uh, larger context. And they do too, but in this way you have sort of what they now call 21st century skills, which I always kind of laugh at that because I think, well, we are in the 21st century, so are they supposed to have 18th century skills? But anyway, it's, you know, educational jargon, which comes and goes. But um, the kids are able to pursue sort of their own interest, but within the context of, of a larger issue. I see. Oh. Now, you've taught different generations of kids, right? Of, or students, let's call them learners. Uh, and I guess there was, I don't know what was pre-Generation X. Right. And then Generation X and then millennials, and I don't know what we call the next one. Have you, have you seen a difference as different waves of, of generations come through? You know, I, I heard a wonderful um, analysis of this by a consultant that uh, Punahou brought in, and I, I, I listened very uh, carefully to what she was saying, and I think there probably are differences, mm -hmm. but I don't really notice them. I mean, I think kids are kids, and uh, they used to be glued to radio uh, in my parents' day, and then, and then in my day they were glued to television, and so was I, and, and now they're glued to their computers. Now, I would say, because computers are handy, and you couldn't bring your huge television to school, that, you know, kids do, you know, they text, and they, and they use, uh, and, and they use uh, computer technology uh, very well, and I learned from a lot of them, because I'm a little bit of a Luddite myself, uh -huh. and you saw my cell phone, it's like 20 years old. Every time I pull it out, people laugh, well, why would I do this right now? See, <laughs> it's a very old cell phone, so, uh, but uh, I learned from them, and what they learned from me is you don't always have to have a computer with you, and I always tell them that, you know, the best computer is between your ears, and uh, one of the problems with the internet, of course, is you can never distinguish with you know, you, can, you can't distinguish sources as easily as you could with a book. I mean, you come, in, you, you, you open up a book and you see who the author is, you see where they're from, are they from an academic institution, um, is this something that's been, you know, hastily put together, and you can tell. Uh, on the internet, you know, th there's, a, you know, a, a variety of different sources, but you don't know which source is actually really reliable. And so that's, that's the, that's, so I, I think it's good to pull, uh, to answer your initial question, it's good to pull from what is modern, and uh, you know, and, and and I think it's also good to pull from the Greeks, because I think they had it down pretty well. <laughs> a few years ago, I was helping develop Hawaiian history, modern Hawaiian history, mm -hmm. and one of the lessons I was testing out was comparing an early Hawaii constitution with the American constitution. What I had forgotten is that those students were not that familiar with the American Constitution. So there was no, nothing to compare it with. That whole rigor of the exercise was lost if they didn't have that basic information. Uh, you know, I was at, I was at a, a large public high school in Hawaii recently, and I was so happy because it was in the library. Well, I'm just going to mention that the, the school, it's the Castle High School, and on the wall of the library is the complete Declaration of Independence and the complete U.S. Constitution. And I felt like, but I, of course, I, it's a library, so I couldn't do it, but I felt like clapping for the <laughs> librarians. <laughs> no. so. Well, that's, that's, it's very interesting, um, the process that you've gone through with being very close to the students. Right? And then along comes this idea of engagement and service learning. And you've been involved with that. So talk a little bit about where that has taken you. You know, there, um, and this has to do with the, really the power, uh, Jim, of teachers. Um, I had uh, several uh, good friends, some of whom you know, um, Josh Rapoon of that famous, you know, Windward Side uh, uh, Rapoon family, a woman from Kamehameha named Judy Kramer, 
um, a, a guy who now teaches at Iolani, Russell Motter, and several other teachers. So I think there's a woman, a wonderful woman from Olomana School, Ellen Schroeder. <clears throat> and we got together and we started performing community service fairs because we wanted our students to be connected to the community. And we had, you know, maybe 100, 150 uh, nonprofits come, and then we had all of our high schools come, all the high school kids come, and take a look at all the different places they could uh, actually work in terms of community service. And then, you know, one thing led to another, and we said, well, why don't we start a nonprofit? And uh, so we did, and we, we did not use any lawyers. We formed our 501c3, and we formed a nonprofit dedicated to um, service learning. It was originally called TESA, Teachers and Students that Work for Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then someone, I think it was Russell, who had one of the best sense of humor, he said, that's too long. <laughs> and people won't get it. So isn't that we, a car? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it a car? Is it, isn't it a group of, of some sort of strange uh, persuasion? Um, and so TESA. I um, mean, so we changed it after a while to Youth Service Hawaii. And we had a wonderful uh, executive director named Kelly Oshiro for a while. Uh, Josh was our original uh, executive director, and she, he worked very closely with uh, the current superintendent's mother, Mary Matayoshi, uh, yeah. who at that time was working in the uh, lieutenant governor's office run by Meiji Hirono. Yes. So it was all, all in the family, sort of, in Hawaii. And uh, this nonprofit, I'm very proud to say it's, it's still in existence, it's still working. I just got to, in fact, I was, I was supposed to be at a meeting last night. I could not because of, you know, engagements I had with students. Um, but the current uh, executive director is Judy Kramer, back to the great, you know, she's a wonderful uh, fourth grade, no, I think now she's sixth grade Kamehameha teacher. And the uh, president is uh, uh, Stephen Nakashima, mm -hmm. and Stephen is a family court judge. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's, uh, a lot of my work is involved working with people who are much smarter and uh, much smarter than myself. And uh, Stephen is one of those, and Judy's another. <laughs> so you're kind of, that, that organization connects students with uh, projects of other organizations that want to recruit them, engage them, excite them. Uh, what we're all about is trying to get kids to, com you know, to commit to service learning, which is not only doing service, it's a little bit above community service, because we ask kids to then do something academic related to their service. So let's say you take kids to IHS, the Institute for Human Services, not only do they have to, to go and work with people and help people who are homeless, but they have to reflect on it and maybe read, you know, George Orwell's Down and Out in Paris and London, which I make my kids read. Uh -huh. So they don't only know about the upscale of London and Paris, but they know about the bottom half uh -huh. of society. And what's interesting, Jim, is that the Weinberg Foundation has been very instrumental in terms of service learning if a nonprofit, um, if, if a, uh, a, a class that is from 7th to 12th grade works for 100 hours at a nonprofit mm -hmm. and they uh, apply to the wonderful woman at Weinberg, Aileen Wong, the Weinberg Foundation, on behalf of the students working 100 hours, will um, donate $5,000 on behalf of the students fantastic, to the nonprofit. Fantastic, fantastic. And they've, they've almost given out a million dollars, I think, by now in, in the community. Wow, fantastic. We are talking with Carl Ackerman, who is the director of the Pueo program at Punahou, which we're going to get into very soon. A longtime history teacher, I love history, uh, and also You're a good man. And, and also uh, helping to create service learning. Uh, so uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back to talk about Pueo. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii. And it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Alvarez from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us. Hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate. Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from 
the people who really know what's going on, uh, like Jim Alberts, we appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Murray Waki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. 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 This is Think Tech Hawaii's education movers, shakers, reformers, and we're talking with Dr. Carl Ackerman of Punahou School, who runs a fantastic partnership program called Pueo, which is an owl, isn't it? It is an owl. Okay, but tell us about Pueo. Well, you know, uh, this is really the vision of my boss, Dr. Jim Scott. You both have that wonderful first name, Jim. Okay. Um, and, you know, he is a, a guy that grew up in Waimanalo and came to Punahou on scholarship. And I think he felt that a private school should play a public purpose. And him, I, I think that to a certain extent, this comes out of his own self-development and that he wanted to be, he wanted the walls uh, at Punahou School to sort of disappear and to become part of the overall community in Hawaii. So that, that's where it all began. Uh, but, the, but the vision behind uh, Pueo um, is his, but uh, I'll, I'll sort of say it very short in a, in a very brief uh, account. And that is uh, what we're trying to do is get uh, public school kids who may not have a lot of money, but who have a lot of aptitude. And we're aiming at the kids in the great middle academically. Um, uh, the kids that are in the top 20%, they're going to go to college no matter what you do. And why should anyone help them? Because they're doing well on their own. Um, but it's often those kids in the great middle um, that are neglected um, in terms of getting all the resources they need. And so we are partnering with our statewide Department of Education. And in order to get, um, now we have about 317 kids in the program every year. Um, kids enter at the fifth grade level. And uh, after the kids finish the seven years of Pueo, they go into their senior year. And then we have a college counselor who meets with every kid 10 or 11 times. And pretty much right now, we have about 98 or 99 percent of our kids graduating from high school. Um, I would say a good 95 percent actually get accepted into college, and about 85 percent are enrolled. So when they enter, they stay with it from year to year. Correct. They're like they, a class. They're they, they're like they're a cohort. They become very close. And uh, we've had situations where kids who want to take you know are supposed to take classes at the, the regular school say, no, I want to go back to my cohort. And so it's a very, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting phenomena. And um, I, you know, for me, uh, as, a, as the director, I mean, I work with a lot of people, <clears throat> but I think one of the keys to our success, well, there, there, I think there are two keys. One is that the kids get some of the best classes um, that they may have ever received because we hire teachers both from the DOE and some of the best teachers like uh, Leonard Jenkins from St. Louis teaches a wonderful marine biology class. Um, but the other part is that the kids can get, and this is, you know, I want to hear a drum roll, drum roll. Uh, the kids can get four credit classes during the summer. So the, the kids that are in high school can get up to six, they get up to three credits, but that's a half credit for, for six classes. And so as uh, one of our students, who's a wonderful uh, young man, Phoenix at Castle says, He's ready to he was ready to graduate at the first semester at Castle during his senior year. So being able to get those four credit classes during uh, the summer are, is really critical. And if we, maybe we could do this system-wide, where there are a lot of summer schools where kids could get four credit classes, we might, we might allow more kids to uh, graduate from high school and then go on to college. So, um, by the way, Pueo stands for? <clears throat> it stands for, pardon me, um, Partnerships and Unlimited Educational Opportunities. But it, our name is not just Pueo. It's the Clarence T.C. Ching Pueo Program right. because yeah. the Clarence T.C. Ching um, came in uh, six years ago and uh, really made possible uh, six years of funding um, and have recently stepped up again um, the wonderful trustees of the Clarence T.C. Ching Foundation and have allowed and have guaranteed funding for the next 10 years. Oh, I see. So we have, you know, a lot of, you know, long after I, you know, there's a, <laughs> I'm getting to be a bit older, Jim, so, you know, long after um, my tenure as director, um, uh, the Clarence T.C. Ching Pueo program will continue, which I'm very happy about. Now, talk a little bit about curriculum. Is it everything under the sun or is it 
you know, focused? What, what, what are you focusing on? No, it, it, it's, it, you know, it's very intentional. And uh, by the way, the, the, the focus on the, on, the, on the kids that are in the middle comes from, and, and I always like to share, and it's probably the historian in me, uh, and text, because I love text, uh, but it came from um, an interesting book called Moneyball. Uh, oh, yes, and, yes. And, uh, you know, this was made Brad into a movie Pitt, with, the movie, yeah, yeah. The, movie made, you know, I, mm. the book was out much, much <laughs> long before the movie with Brad Pitt, but the movie was actually pretty close to the, the original text. But what um, Billy Bean did of the Oakland A's and in terms of baseball was he said, I can't compete with the Yankees, I can't pe compete with the Boston Red Sox. So what I'm going to have to do is figure out how to get the base, best baseball players without spending lots of money. And so what he did is he, he looked at metrics and he said, hey, um, I want to look at the best on-base percentages. To heck with someone who looks like a baseball player. We want to look at the metrics. So we aimed at the middle kids because we felt that the kids that are in the middle in the, in the DOE are the kids that most easily can be pushed up. The bottom 20% also get a lot of um, federal programming. The top 20%, you know, as I said before. So anyway, now to describe the, um, uh, the Puyo program. When the kids come into the program in their first two years, they get some of the best classes, and this is during the summer part of the program, because we have a year-round program too. But during the summer program, the uh, kids get a class called Up, Up, and Away. Uh, they get RoboLab, and Up, Up, and Away is all about um, aerodynamics, and the kids fly airplanes, they shoot off rockets, they get to fly in a, a real flight simulator. They then go into RoboLab, which is, you know, all, um, all about uh, robotics and you know I mean I think people know about what, what robotics is you know they make Legos move through, you know and if you ask me what they're doing I can sort of describe it generally but the kids are much more advanced than I am uh, they then go to the Punahou cafeteria and they get wonderful Punahou food in fact I, I think I spotted a Milano cookie the other day and I went oh this is such great food you know I mean it's for dessert obviously but our cafeteria manager provides the food and then um, in the afternoon, we, we have a system that we call holiday time for the first two years. And what we do is we, we hire kids who have graduated from public high schools who are going on to college, or kids that are already in college, and also Punahou kids and Iolani kids and you know, any, any, any kind of kid who is going off to college or in college. And we have them under the direction of two master teachers teach the kids um, both English and math where they need help. And while the first two years, including a marine biology class during their second year, while the, while the subject matters of the mornings are important, the fact that these kids that are in the Puyo program get to see their older brethren um, who are college bound, and they can talk about their you know, University of California, University of Hawaii, um, you know, the Princetons, the Yales, the Ivy League, the Claremont McKennas, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that they will get a culture of college, and I always tell the kids, what group are you in? Are you in? And the kids yell out, Pueo! And I say, where are you going? And they say, college. And so what we're doing is we're providing a culture of college um, in the program. And uh, in the third year of the program, they take um, an intensive English class taught by a wonderful man named Pete Barraza who comes originally from Santa Monica High School. Yay, Samuel High. Mm -hmm. I have to make a plug for my alma mater. And, uh, and then also they take a great class taught by a wonderful Iolani teacher named Aaron Nagoshi. In the afternoon, it's magical because it's taught by Brad Kerwin, our magician. And you might think to yourself, why, why a magic class in, uh, in an academic program? And that's because when kids learn magic, they have to go up in front of a group and present it and uh, they get great oral skills. They're able to go in front of an audience, and you know, I, I've never seen in my life a better teacher than Brad Kerwin. Um, he is, you know, he's a retired uh, supervisor from Punahou, but he is really, he, he's really the best. He's, there are many great teachers in Pueo, but this guy really is magical, mm -hmm. and, and for obvious reasons. And then uh, in the high school years, Jim, what the kids get is they get a series of classes that are for credit classes in the DOE. Uh, participation in democracy, Hawaiian history. They get an arts class where they come together in their, uh, close to their graduation, two years away from graduation. And that class is taught by uh, a guy named uh, John Siprit. And John Siprit was the man, if you watched the new version of the Hawaii Five-0, and I, you and I are, uh, it's very difficult to get us to have time to watch television. but. 
John Siprit shot Dano in the very first episode of the new version of Hawaii Five-0. Unfortunately, that meant that he's no longer on the uh, <laughs> on the show, but it meant that he's you know our wonderful actor dancer um, man in uh, in our P6 program. And we have, you know, in, in the in the culminating year, uh, I've missed a couple of classes, but in the culminating year, in the P7 year, not only do they write a, a big paper, but we take the kids to uh, the University of Hawaii where they take a college counseling class. Mm. And that was originally taught by the wonderful Dan Feldhaus, the retired college counselor from Iolani. And now it's taught by a wonderful man that we stole from the University of Hawaii, Hilo, who is their admissions director named Curtis Nishioka. And uh, we try to also take, although it's not part of our overall mission, we try to keep in touch with the kids that are you know, in college and support them. So over time, you kind of start them with hands-on STEM-like stuff. Correct. But then you move through the the regular disciplines all the way through. That's exact, That's a great assessment. And and you and it's, you said it's also a year-long. You have a year-long engagement with these cohorts. Um, we try to touch bases with the kids um, at least two or three times during the year, and we recently had, and I'm very proud of this partnership, uh, a partnership with the Art Academy and the school there. Um, the Honolulu Art Academy, um, run by uh, Vince Hazen, who's a principal over there in the school there. And the kids last spring took over the entire Art Academy for a day. There were five cohorts of 40, and each of our cohorts, like uh, you know, the kids that come in in fifth grade represent a group of 40, and it goes all the way up to their junior year. So we have roughly about 317 kids, because I try to add kids where I can. Um, the kids completely took over the art class. Uh, our art art uh, academy, and they had everything from uh, photography to painting um, to um, all sorts of arts where they were uh, uh, talking about Buddhism and art, and um, it was just a marvelous day. And these are the kind of activities that we schedule. We have a agreement now with the Aviation Museum, so they'll go there in the spring, and different groups of kids will go at different times. Um, one of our initial uh, uh, one of our initial um, days, and you know, it depends on what the subject matter is. What the subject matter will dictate which, how old the kids are that go to the day. So that maybe the P1s will go to an art art workshop, and the kids that are in the older group will go to a testing day where they're mm -hmm. preparing for the SAT and you know whatever. So, um, what I was really, what I really loved was one of our first uh, our first days, which was a, a poetry day. And it was led by the famous uh, poet of Hawaii, Imai Kalahele. And that was, that was also very magical. And uh, it, you know, Imai really brought the house down. And um, he was very good with our kids. So, you know, we, we would draw on the resources of Hawaii in order to get the uh, kids the best education possible. Wow. You know, I want to, when we, after, after we have our break, I want to talk a little bit about how you would replicate this, if at all. Uh, it sounds like you very eclectic, diverse, finding the stars in education and collecting them, uh, but also um, uh, maybe what it costs uh, to do this sort of thing. Um, so you are watching Think Tech Hawaii's focus on education movers, shakers, reformers, and we're looking at student-centered partnerships with Dr. Carl Ackerman, We'll be back in a minute. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading, cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state. Or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us and thanks for supporting us. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Focus on Education Movers, Shakers, Reformers, 
and our special guest, Dr. Carl Ackerman, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of their fantastic Pueo program. So, Carl, you know, whenever you hear about these wonderful programs, you hear, oh, you've got this, this teacher from here, it's eclectic, you're pulling from all sort of things. But, you know, the big bugaboo in education is scaling up and replicating. Talk about that. You know, um, I'll end with sort of a, a philosophical point, but um, let me begin and answer your question directly. Um, one of the things that I, I, I failed to mention, you know, earlier in our discussion is that the way we recruit the students is that we actually, the, re the recruitment comes from the principals in the DOE. And so we don't recruit them, we just give criteria to DOE principals. I and mean, we now have, you know, 64 schools that are involved, but about, uh, more than 20, 25 schools. Well, I would say about 20 schools are now nominating kids. So that's really great. Now, to answer your question specifically, um, about three years into the program, uh, a friend of mine named Milton Chen, uh, and this is a, a great, great show to be on because you know he's the guy of Edutopia, and yeah. uh, his his former employer is George Lucas because you know uh, George Lucas and the Educational Foundation. But Milton said to me, well, you know, this is great that you did this. How did you, how did you formulate your ideas? And I said, well, I talked to a whole bunch of people doing similar things on the continent. And he said, well, why don't you have an organization uh, that actually allows you to replicate programs like Pueo, but giving a lot of leeway to the schools that start. So we started private schools with a public purpose, PSPP. And uh, we're about to have our ninth symposia in Cleveland at a school called Hathaway Brown. And last year, um, uh, our last uh, um, symposium was in San Francisco. And the purpose of these symposia is to gather people from private and public schools in a given area. This last year was in San Francisco so that we can replicate the programs. And I'm very happy to say that our sister school, Iwani, um, sister school to Pudaho, um, has started a Kai program. And they're doing something very similar to Pueo. And uh, um, most recently, uh, two years ago, Sacred Heart started, and they're working with Palolo Elementary School, you know, under the guidance of that wonderful um, headmaster, Betty, Betty White. And so they're working, and I just found out this year that uh, Hawaii Preparatory Academy, under uh, Shirley Ann Fukumoto's, Fukumoto's uh, guidance, is starting um, a program at HPA. So through this PSPP, through a network of private schools um, and uh, people in the DOE, our, our main partner in the DOE, and I should mention her name because she has helped us in so many ways, Colleen Murakami, um, helped us facilitate this from the DOE, DOE side and people like Allison Blackingship at Iolani School or Shirley Ann Fukumoto or Betty White um, and her wonderful um, uh, Vice Principal Remy um, are people that actually talk to other schools so that things can be replicated. And there's a, you know, uh, um, the Learning Coalition, uh, especially um, uh, people like uh, uh, Bill Reeves, who's been involved with educational pursuits in Hawaii, has been very helpful in this regard, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually have a mechanism by which we can replicate, but not replicate in terms of, you know, having a franchise like a McDonald's or a franchise, uh, I don't know, like Jack in the Box, but allowing each school to do their own thing because each school, each private and public school has a different culture. Um, but allowing it to actually uh, work. And, and I promised you a, a philosophical approach. And that is, you know, I think most educational reform is focused on how can we improve the schools. And, uh, and uh, I'm not really, you know, my, uh, my view about education is that everyone's a player and everyone should be supported. I mean, some people, you know, um, blame unions. And I, you know, that's not the way I grew up. I thought unions were great. They protect workers, right? So, I mean, I, I have a hard time when people cast stones at other folks. And I think what we do is we work together. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean we always agree. You have to argue with people. Uh, but you work together and you, and you, uh, you uh, sometimes, uh, you know, people say, I'm, I'm strident. And I say, well, no, I'm not, I'm not strident. I'm just persistent. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, but... I think my approach is not how you, my, I don't begin with the question, how do you improve schools? My question is, how do you improve the life for every individual student? Uh -huh. In other words, I can't think past, and I, I talk to every student every summer, and I, I spend the time, the last two weeks of the program, talking to every student. 
Because if you don't begin there and you have a top-down approach, I think that sometimes you, you, miss, you miss it. And, you don't, you don't, and a lot of well-intentioned programs that are very uh, on a high level, on an institutional level, miss the boat. Uh, because they, the money doesn't trickle down to the to the individual kid, so that's just a difference in philosophy. And I have nothing against people talking about educational reform and their movements, but I just my approach is different, and my where I want to put my energy is different. Okay, so having said that, though, the program does cost some money. Right? It does. So, is there a kind of per pupil general amount that you think, uh, if someone wanted to consider replicating this? They're going to need to generate. I, I would say, and I, I, you know, I, you know, I'm glad you asked this question because, you know, about the third or fourth year of the program, I examined it nationally, and I said, okay, I've got to do this. So it's about two thousand. I would say two thousand to about four thousand dollars per per child. I'm happy per to per year. Per year. Per year. So it's expensive, um, but I think, I mean, well, it's not expensive. If you think about if you can, if you have a program like um, the Clarence T.C. T. C. Ching Puyo program, and you can almost guarantee that every kid in the program is going to go on and graduate from high school and, and you know, enroll in college. If you can guarantee that, and it only costs you $2,000 a year, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good thing. But, um, uh, but it's, it is, um, it, these are monies, and these are all private monies that are coming to us. I mean, it's, uh, Clarence T.C. Ching is our biggest benefactor, um, but the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Foundation uh, was one of our benefactors, the Harold K. L. Castle Foundation, was a big benefactor in the very beginning, um, Unbound Philanthropy, and others, the Suha Foundation, and then we have, you know, smaller donations from um, other people in, in uh, the community. Sure. And um, I was surprised myself about how generous people were um, in this area, but I think the secret to it is that they understand that everyone in the program, including myself, has their, you know, has a laser focus on the kids, mm -hmm. and that everyone in the Puyo program. We also have a very horizontal structure. Maybe that's it. That you know, if you ever come into my office, uh, there are, are, are about six people sitting around me, and uh, and, and kids come in, and there's a big flow of kids. And you know, I'm able to, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's because I, I came from a fairly large family. I'm able to do my work <laughs> well. Well, there's a lot of commotion around me, or maybe it's having children, right? Uh, so. Uh, I think that horizontal structure is something I'm very proud of. That everyone, you know, you're the director of Pueo, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to make the phone call to get the kids there. You're the director of Pueo, but you don't let, it doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to deliver the lunch to every kid on a tray. Uh, you know, you just get to be, I think in education often we get put into silos, and I'm not, I'm not a big believer in silos. Now you've kind of touched on this with your philosophy. But you've been involved and seen a lot of education mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And if, if, you know, I were to ask you, what is the status of education in Hawaii? I mean, uh, are, are we as a state overall, public, private, everything, moving forward? Are we treading water? Uh, where do you see the greatest hope, the greatest challenges? Give us a little of your broad perspective here. Well, you know, I'm a big... Um, I'm a, I'm a big admirer of our superintendent, um, Kathy Matayoshi, and uh, Catherine Matayoshi. So I think I would start there. Um, I, when I go into schools, I'm always amazed at how much is on a principal's plate. Yes. Um, and I, you know, there are principals like Derek Minakami at Kaneohe Elementary School, uh, Naomi Matsusaki at the Kahalu Elementary School. You could talk about... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, Mr. Okamura at, um, at uh, Roosevelt. Um, you can talk about many different principles, and I always see them just, there's just so much stuff coming at them. And I'm always amazed at their heroic ability to do many things. And you have to remember, I think that, you know, I think sometimes criticism of the Department of Education and our public schools is uh, too heavy handed. And the reason I think that is because our top kids. In the United States, meaning the kids that score the best on tests and things like this, can you know uh, uh, measure up to any kids across the world. It's just that we don't have a very hierarchical system. Everyone in our country gets a public education, and that means you know uh, that a kid who has you know um, learning disabilities, that means a kid who is 
you know, um, you know, I watched a kid who was an Iron Long um, get an education. I'm very proud of that, and I, I believe in American democracy, and I believe that public education is the answer. Is there room for improvement? Yes, and I see, I see um, charter schools as one vehicle by which people are experimenting a lot, but they're also experimenting in the in the regular uh, public schools. And let me tell you about something I'm very proud of, and it's not really related to Hawaii, but um, I have a sister named Liz Hicks, and she is a counselor in Los Angeles, and she just started, uh, she will start a year from now, the first all-girls public school in um, the LA Unified School District. And she's going to draw on the same sort of socioeconomic criteria mm -hmm. that Pueo uh, does. So, I mean, I think there's great hope. I have hope every day. Um, but I think that uh, uh, if I were to offer sort of a blanket comment about where we can improve is, I think we have to allow teachers, counselors, and um, principals to do their jobs. And I think the job is to focus on every kid and remove the paperwork. And I think also, um, including, uh, because I teach AP European History in addition to being the director of Pueo, I think everyone should teach. I mean, you have people in the business office that, that of course, are providing us with all sorts of, you know, I mean, we have to, have to have a human resources person, et cetera. But by and large, if you had everyone in the school teaching or somehow working with the kids, interacting with the kids on a day-to-day -day basis, I think you could improve education and reduce costs. Now, recently, there's a new group uh, uh, started by Randy Roth and some principals that have been sort of hammering away at this notion of the school-level decision-making and, and the sort of top-down bureaucracy and the red tape. Have you heard about that, and do you think they're on the right track? Um, you know, I, I know Randy Roth, and um, I, I think he's a wonderful man, so I'm sure he's thinking great things. And I've been reading about it in the newspaper, of course, uh -huh. which is, you know, we ain't found out about such things like everyone else in Hawaii. Or I, I shouldn't say, the younger generation does it online. I still like the, uh -huh. the hand newspaper. Uh, but it seems like that seems like, a, a, like a, a very good idea, but I don't think anyone should see... People often think that there's a... Um, easy answer, you know, the silver bullet, and yeah. there isn't. I mean, yeah. it's multifaceted, and I still go back to, I think Lyndon Johnson was right. I mean, I think that um, poverty, um, and I also think parenting is a big issue, and um, I think, and I see this in the Pueo program, um, you know, we have great parents who are in support of the program, but if you have parents that are not in support of their local public school, that becomes hard, and then it becomes the role of the teacher, the principal, and the counselor to do the job that the parents should be doing. So I think we all have to be responsible. We all have to do so. And I, you know, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm as guilty as any other parent. I'll put something up on the, on the, on the refrigerator and I'll forget. And I'll go, oh my God, we have to get this in. And you know, I feel bad about it. So I mean, no one's perfect. And I just think we have to take, I don't think you improve education within the term of one governor or, or you know, one governor. I think you improve education over the term of maybe five or 10 governors. I think it's a slow process. No one should be in a hurry. Um, we want to do the best for our kids, but it just doesn't seem to me that there is a, um, that, that, that the time that people want to improve, by which people want to improve education, you know, they want to come in and improve, okay, we're going to improve all of Hawaii's schools within eight years. I think that's unreasonable. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much for those insights. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, this is uh, our first education sort of talk show yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, and I'm very I'm very happy that we have someone who's very student centered because that's where it does begin and that's where you have been really emphasizing it so can, you, I, can I make one last comment because sure. I mean, this is actually critical for any kind of program like Powell. Um you do need the um, you do need the support of, of your boss and um, uh, you know, without hyperbole, I have a, uh, a wonderful man, an honorable man by the name of Jim Scott, who is Dr. Jim Scott, who is the person that makes this all possible. And, and I say this um, really uh, without hyperbole because you need someone who will allow you to be a bit entrepreneurial in terms of your ideas. And uh, without him, Poyo would not be possible. Great. You've been watching, I think, Tech Hawaii's education series on... Movers, Shakers, Reformers, I'm Jim Sean. I'm your host. Join us next week at noon where we're going to be looking at the University of Hawaii and the role of mediation and maybe reviving 
that strange term, the ombudsman. Aloha.